this reminds me of when I was sort of, before I got into informal learning, I sort of profit for e-learning. I'm not gonna defend e-learning because it means whatever you want it to mean now. But then people say, oh, this will never be as good as a classroom. I say, well, hold it. it it's on 24 seven, it scales, it's worldwide. You can get in touch with people you couldn't get in touch with before. Why is the classroom any good? You know, and so I, I, I've taken the starting point, uh, you know, uh, sort of equality. <laughs> I think formal learning benefits when it's merged with informal learning when an on-campus program involves off-campus work. We've all seen cases where people do great in school and terrible in life. And we've, we see you know, grades that are related to nothing, not to income, not to happiness, not to power, not to marital status, not to drug addiction, to nothing. How can anything be so totally irrelevant? Well, it's because often in school there's a mistake of grading the individual without thinking of how we get along with other people. And in real life, sorry, it's getting along with other people, which is number one. And I think f formal learning sometimes is guilty of just looking at the student and assuming that something can be done you know, by studying hard in the library, rather than getting out and doing stuff. I'm, I'm a big proponent of doing stuff. I know I'm drifting away from your question, but I, I think it's, it's silly for formal learning not to be pragmatic and have people do things rather than just sort of think about things and as you said talk about stuff and go through the motions. I, I have a picture of my son when he was two and a half years old and he's holding up a book. Now it's actually a, a technical catalog and it's upside down but he's there because he saw mom and dad hold up books so he, and he's just going through the motion. And I'd say it, but I think a lot of students are doing just about the same thing. It's very difficult to implement it in Portugal, you will, Jay. But in any way, let me stop you. Okay. It, it, it's not implementing informal learning. People are learning now informally. It's so we can make it better, that we can do a better job rather than just sort of, oh, go figure it out for yourself. So there's this trick. People think, oh, this is something new. No, this is the way the world works we can make it work a little smoother. As far as convincing a CEO, I would not talk about informal learning. This is just between us, okay? <laughs> if, if, if I'm giving the proverbial elevator pitch, so the CEO walks in the elevator, I've got a minute to get my idea across. I'm not gonna talk about learning. I'm not gonna talk about knowledge management. I'm not gonna talk about social networking. None of that, because they would be thinking, schooling, goofing off, Facebook nonsense. I'm gonna talk about how can we make this a better business? Wouldn't we rather have our people work smarter? Wouldn't we rather harness the collective intelligence of the workforce? Wouldn't we like to be able to have our customers on this journey of learning with us? You know, you got time to talk about that? And usually, yeah, they talk about that. So learning's embedded in all of that, but bring it up too early. It's, it's not a CEO type. Ainda conservadora da parte do management uh, dentro dessa organização e como tirar partido dela. Okay. First of all, obrigado. <laughs> those, those, those are set up questions. I mean, this is just perfect. I mean, you mentioned uh, the training requirements at British Telecom. There was an amazing thing that came about. You know, it, telephone companies got a problem because, you know, there's a new cell phone like every week, and sort of how do we keep up with this? And all these complicated things, and if it's something, you know, like a, an iPhone or an Android, it takes forever to answer all the questions and things. So how do you do this? Well, when Peter Butler came into British Telecom as chief learning officer like four years ago, he looked and he saw they were developing these training programs and they put people on airplanes to go around the world and explain their new product. So it cost a fortune and there'd be yet another product coming out the next week so it didn't do any good and they replaced it with little flip camps where they'd come up and they'd say, you, explain this phone to me. And they just record it. They put it on the internet. 
And that was the training. They ask questions if you need something more, and they put the questions up on the internet. So it was immediate, and it was quick, and it didn't involve putting people on airplanes anymore. The thing you mentioned in the technical excellence program and the need for certification, it's a similar thing for people who work in banking, pharmaceuticals, airlines, anything where there's a, a technical excellence that has to be achieved, a standard. But the question is, do you want to do just the minimum to get certification, or do you want people to be all they can be? You can take the formal part and then supplement it, make it richer by having additional things before and after. Before, what's the importance of this? We don't want to go into a customer's house and screw things up. Afterward, horror stories, things that did work well, you know, new developments. And this is a type of thing, creating the learning environment for that, it's like having brown bag lunch sessions, but you buy the lunch and say, this one we're going to talk about technical excellence. I'll buy the sandwiches, you talk about it. But, you know, to keep the subject alive, a, a problem with compliance training and certification training is that it is an event. You do this, get that checked off, and then it's, well, I'm free for a while. Well, no, no, you've got to keep the excellence up, you know, so it has to be a, a continuous, ongoing thing with commitment. One of the old management paradigms was that the manager is in control of the people. That's an illusion. That was never true. It's really not true now. People are, by and large, self-motivated. And what are they motivated by? They're motivated by autonomy, the feeling that I can do something. I'm not just a cog in the machine. If I'm in a Viva call center, I can say, I can make a difference. I can improve customer service. They are motivated by mastery, by getting better at something. The reason, say, people take up guitar and become almost professional quality just because they want to do it really well. And we're all motivated by doing things well. And finally, it's by serving a greater purpose, by being a part of things. And I'm sure somebody's very proud if they can say, hold it, I have helped the customers of Portugal Telecom. I mean, that's, that's a much bigger thing than just, I've done my job. So it's been really, uh, um really important to get the CEOs on board and the IT team to open the port as well for these kind of social networks that used to be uh, closed for them. So they had been socialized that they can't, you know, this is a no in my institution. So maybe this is a kind of a call out for, for the CEOs here that maybe you need to start doing what you preach uh, and, and also get the IT on board. So that, that was an experience, it was quite surprising. I, I had never kind of came across something like that. So. Christina, thank you. That to me, there's a, a basic thing on changing behavior. And it's just, you got to do it. I, for too many years, I worked with banks. And first, it was training bank officers how to make sound loan decisions. And that's tough sometimes, because personality gets in the way, and their decisions aren't rational. But then I got involved in training bankers to sell things. And they were so reluctant. We had a program, and the, the sole objective was to get people in the branches to pick up the phone, call customers, and say, hey, this is your banker. How are you doing? Anything we can help you with? And everybody would say, oh, yeah, I understand. I understand. I'm going to get a bonus for this and whatever. And nobody would do it. My company developed the one workshop that got people to do it. And the way it would be is we'd come into the room and we'd say, here's a phone, pick it up. I'm gonna record how long it takes you to just call somebody and say, hi, I'm your banker. And then we'd turn in the, how long it took. And after somebody had made three phone calls, they were saying, well, you know, they really like talking to their banker. This is not so bad. And all the things that they'd imagined that were gonna go wrong disappeared. And I, I find it again and again with social technologies. People say, ah, you know, I'd never do that. They get into it, they say, boy, this is pretty cool, you know? And so I'm a big fan of just do it. <laughs> if I were looking at the effectiveness of a corporate learning program, I'd do a couple of things. 
One is that I would go out and do intense interviews with people long after they participated. I mean, stuff that, you know, measurement of stuff right afterward, the next week or whatever, that's crazy because you don't know if their performance is going to last or not. But, you know, give things six months, then go out, where did you figure out how to do this? Did your behavior change? Are you doing things differently? Maybe there's a control group where you're going to look at people who participated and people who didn't, things like that. But you can interview, I used to work for a Gallup poll. We could, you know, talk with 200 people and predict an election. You can talk with a handful of workers and determine whether or not their learning is as effective as it might be. And I, I favor that, that sort of measurement over the trying to get something out of a learning management system or counting hours in classrooms or stuff like that. Now we're here to learn, right? And we want to hold on to things. So talk is just talk unless you do something about it, unless you take some action. So what I'm going to ask you to do next is to talk with one another about what action you're going to take. What, if anything, you're going to take away from this morning and you're going to do it differently. But you don't have to do it here because now it's time for a break. So during the break, talk about that. Rigato.